Hello everyone, and for today's piano pandemic activity video, I'm going to sit in on a private lesson. Uh, my student has sent me his recording of this piece by Jean-Philippe Rameau, and so I'm going to make some suggestions to him, but you're welcome to listen in because there are things that I might say to any player of this piece. First of all, what, what is this thing? This is the entry of Polymnia from Les Boréades by Jean-Philippe Rameau. It's a, it's a little musical interlude, um, some stage music, you know, for people to move around in the opera. Uh, my student uh, has been gone since the quarantine, and I'm not entirely sure where he found this. I imagine it's from the YouTube videos of Vikinger Olafsson, a Norwegian pianist who's very, very good and um, playing for Deutsche Grammophon and has some really nice, uh, visually nice, and of course the audio is really great too, uh, recordings of, of various pieces, including this one. I think there are three things to talk about with this piece. First is issues that naturally arise when one plays transcriptions, and this is a transcription. This particular one, uh, uh, arranged by Andreas Edlund, I don't know who that is, but um, found it online. And, uh, you know, th th there are some questions that arise uh, depending on the piano and the room that you're in and, and what you want to get out of it. So we can talk about that. The second is just how to play stuff like this to get that glorious melty chocolate warm sound. And the third thing is what does Partimento tell us about what's happening in this piece? How can we understand this musical thinking more from the point of view of an 18th century musician? So the first issue... Uh, of of transcription, um, if I were to play this piece myself, I probably wouldn't just take somebody's transcription. I would want to go back to the original and look at what all the instruments are doing, where all the vo where all the lines go, um, are they all accounted for? Are there anything? Is there anything missing? Is there anything I'd like to add? Is there anything unnecessary? And and just you know go to the source material um, and and see what's out there. So if again, if I were playing this myself, that's exactly what I would do. Uh, I think it's probably a perfectly fine trans transcription as is. Um, but for example, what is that? You know, is is that to be played with one hand or two hands? You know, it's it's actually not playable as written. If you ever wanted to share this with others or or give it to students or something, you'd actually not be able to do things like that. The other issue is that there should be a quarter rest right here because that voice is coming in. Those are small issues, but I don't know. I just like to take care of stuff like that. Okay, so um, beyond questions of just making sure you're working with a transcription that makes you happy, the, um, the first thing that I see is this question of long notes that are tied over the bar line. And we have one here, 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 hia, 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 hia and others we'll look at later. Uh, the reason these are so important is that these are dissonances. And the way dissonances work in 18th century music, they're prepared in advance as consonances. Something else in the music changes that turns them into dissonances. They're dissonant and then they resolve by step. So here this D is a consonance, but we the bass moves, so now we have a fourth, which is dissonant in 18th century music. So it's dissonant and it resolves by step to a consonance. Likewise, the, uh, the C sharp here becomes dissonant a ninth against the bass, the B becomes a fourth against the bass, and so on. I have a simple question for you. What good is a sound if you can't hear that sound? If the sound of a dissonance is supposed to be an important part of music, what do you have if you don't have the sound? The answer is you have nothing. What what use is the flavor if you can't taste the flavor? It's of no use. So my first concern would be, how am I going to hear these? Now, I don't know what this would be in the original instrumentation. You know, maybe violins or something. Well, violin has no problem just holding over the bar line. The piano does have a problem. Now, I can just barely hear that note 
because I'm here for real in the room. It probably doesn't come through on the video at all. Um, I, I was just listening to the, the guy on YouTube, Vikinger Olafsson. Even with those spectacular, expensive Deutsche Grammophon microphones and probably a concert grand piano in a perfectly acoustic great space, I actually can't hear his on the downbeat, playing it on my laptop. Uh, so, I, I don't know, that, you know, it makes me think, well, what, what's it for if I can't hear it? A friend of mine once was, uh, we were discussing a Chopin Bach roll, and there's a place where there's a, a chord that's played before the beat, and then some editions have it tied over, and some people re-strike it. And, and he would say, well, the fact that your hand is on it, even though you can't hear it because there's a big chord down here, the fact that your hand is on it will get the listener to believe they heard it. And I thought, I think you're giving way too much credit to the listener. Um, maybe a trained professional musician who, who kind of knows how dissonances work will know that that's probably going to be one and they'll sort of imagine it. But, you know, come on. People will see your hand there and imagine, I just, I just don't buy this. So I would think about a couple things. One is, what if I played it, instead of as a single note, if I played it as an octave? Would that be enough sound over the bar line? And I'm leaving out ornaments for now, just for simplicity's sake. Sorry, that should be C-sharp. Could you pick that up? You know, maybe that's a solution. Tell you what I would probably do. I would probably be, what's our word? Gauche. I would be gauche and I might re-strike that node. I would really consider re-striking it. You might hate that. You might rather not hear it at all. But these are the questions that I would try to address. I'd try to at least think about it. Here's what I would not do. I would not put my hand on it, and then the downbeat comes, and I don't ask whether anybody can hear it or not. I will just say, well, my hand was on it, so I did a good job. Can I have my sticker and go to recess, please? That's not really a musician's way of thinking. That's a, that's a school kid's way of thinking. All right, now we actually have these other dissonances, and these ones are easier because they're lower. Oh, now it doesn't want to... Now my electric pencil doesn't want to talk to the iPad. Okay, so I've got this one, this one. Those are easier just because they're lower and so they ring longer, so I could get away with. Now it's a little easier. See, now it's getting really good as it gets lower. So, nobody has to do it my way. These are only suggestions. But these are the kinds of things that I would think about. Because I promise you, in Rameau's thinking, in the composer's thinking, these suspensions are the most important thing happening. These are the frosting and the sprinkles on the cake. Everything else is, you know, the plate and the napkin and everything else. This, this is the good stuff. So I would deal with it. Okay, um... So, moving on, now we have these other dissonances, and, yeah, now the pencil works, cool. Um, this is interesting because it's in the bass, so there's one, A over the bar line, and then G over the bar line, okay, twice. Same question, is if I can't hear it, is it any good? Okay, now right here in the room, I can kind of pick up on that, um, but 
I'm really obsessive and I've been trained in this harmony and you know my ears are kind of double the normal size and all that stuff. So I don't know that my listener really would. What I'm trying to hear, I'm trying to hear that sound. Okay, and it's especially important that it be clear because with this little ornament in the soprano, that's beautifully supported by this harmony. It's really gorgeous. So again, I could try to play enough sound here at the initiation of it. I could re-strike it maybe here or here. Uh, why don't I try just playing it loud at the beginning? Mm, it could be enough. It's gonna depend on the piano and depend on the room. Okay, now. Um, by re-striking it, I get a lot more. That one's easier because it's shorter, so I don't have as much time for the decay. And uh, so this is, you know, these are the issues you have to deal with. By the way, these little melodic things. That's just classic Rameau. Rameau, you know, the music is like ballet. It's this gorgeous, graceful stuff. It's quite incredible. Uh, all right, and then we head toward a cadence. Next section starts here, and what's going on? First of all, I need to hear this little imitation. Da 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 dum, bum 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 bum, bum 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 bum, bum 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 bum, bum 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 bum, bum 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 bum. Okay, everyone's playing this little game. entirely sure what's supposed to happen on this chord that should be D major or it should you know have some should resolve somehow and it kind of doesn't in this transcription so again that would send me back to the original to find out what in the world's going on I mean these guys would sooner walk the plank than not resolve a dissonance it's it's just an article of faith um, so when I see um, these dissonances not really clearly resolved, I'm, I'm wondering where they went and whether, whether in fact it is so. Okay, so we need to hear these, um, these little imitations. And uh, then, this is just a very small issue, but it's kind of important. Right through here, we have a cadence in A major, and we have this dissonance in the alto a little ninth that resolves to an eighth. Uh, it, well, it actually resolves to a sixth against that, <laughs> but, a, but a tenth against that, or octave against that. Uh, but what's funny is that even though it's written as tied from here, you have to re-strike it there. And this is just a goofy keyboard thing that happens. So you actually don't need to worry about the tie. <laughs> You just hold it the second time when it's a 16th note right there you just hang on to it and then you play the C sharp a little bit quieter and and you get that gorgeous sound okay and by the way look at this there's a little parallel fits for you. Um, yeah, it's quite possible that those are in the original. Sometimes they didn't care about them between, you know, if an inner voice was involved. But I would also, again, check. I'd want to know. I just want to know stuff like that. Did Rameau write these parallel fits? Um, and then, um, again, now we have a lot of um, long ties there there 
So I want to be able to hear those over the bar line if I possibly can. Okay, that's gorgeous by the way. What a sinuous line. So we're going to make sure to hear those. And then it gets even a little bit thicker down here. Again, we have things like that. The same note played twice. So you just play it twice and you hold it the second time. So we'd want to hear that over the bar line. Or would it sound better? Just don't play it here. Just play it here and, and tie it. It might sound a little better. And something I do, and I always ask my students to do this, is go ahead and unbalance the sound in a passage like this so that you can hear everything. Uh, so let's let's hear. Let's hear that. I can hear anything else. How about this? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a little tough to hear this inner one. You could maybe sing it. And then, by the way, it vanishes. <laughs> See, we go from three voices to, to two, so it just disappears. But I would especially hear this top one, and then I would make sure to hear the bass. know all those parts. Almost so that you could sing every part. Once you've heard it and you've sung it and you've thought about it, that now you're never going to neglect it when you play it. But it's when you haven't really paid attention to it that you're going to play it with violent inattention to what's actually going on. So, you know, we'll just, that's just the first page with um, some of the important tone production issues. Now uh, we'll go back and look at some of the Part of partimental related issues. I'll erase as much of this as I can. Okay, so, and we'll go backwards to do this. So we'll start here, and what we have is um, it's very well disguised so that it's, it's actually hard to pick this out on the page, but this passage is built around something called 5-6. Uh, and this idea of 5-6 would have been hilariously familiar to anybody, any trained musician from this time, because they taught this in the, in the partimental tradition. 5-6 is simply the idea that intervals can move up by going from fifths to sixths. And they're usually accompanied by a third. And this is a standard voice leading uh, kind of thing. If, if music were comedy, this would be a knock-knock joke. It's one of the earliest structures that you learn. 
So what's going on is it actually starts on a sixth right here. And the sixth is between C sharp and A. And then the, the bass moves up. And the A is not printed here, but it's theoretically there. So now you have a fifth. Now it moves up to B right there, so you have a sixth. Now the bass catches up, E, so you have a fifth. The upper voice goes to C sharp, so you have a sixth. The bass catches up fifth. And now, mm, again, is kind of hidden. We do have a D there that creates the sixth. And then we have the fifth. And then we kind of resolve here to a third. So what we have is... the inner voice now let me play it as written and you'll hear harmonically it's kind of the same thing You can hear it's, the, it's, it's made out of that simple version. It's just elaborated much more. So this is known as the 5-6 or the ascending 5-6, and it goes up. And everybody who has studied Partimento understands this. There are entire endless, endless Partimento exercises just to practice this and just to learn how to locate it when it's hidden like this. Uh, how to disguise it yourself and how to improvise on it. So that's five six. The next one, let's see, where is it? We will start right here. And what we have between the bass and this note is a fifth. And this note rises to a sixth. And now the bass drops and we create a seventh between the bass and that note. And the upper note a note drops, resulting in a sixth. Bass drops, so now we have a seventh. Bass drops, and we have a sixth. And then the bass leaps, and so the motion is over. Okay? So, we start with a fifth, open it up to a sixth, drop to a seventh. And now they chase each other down. And we could keep going. That too is usually accompanied by a sixth, or a third rather. And we can keep going. Although Rameau cuts it off. And, and switches to something else. So this little pattern is known as 7-6 or descending 7-6. And it too is a standard motion of the Partimento tradition. And uh, within that tradition we learn how it works, um, all the different ways we can alter it, and how to detect it when it's hidden uh, inside a, a pattern and how to improvise it ourselves. So, two cool bass motions, two cool little schemes, the ascending and descending. As we keep going backwards, now we'll begin here, and what we got is the bass goes there, and jumps to there, and goes to there, and goes to there. So it goes up a fourth, down a third, up a fourth. Okay? And this has a name. Up a fourth, down a third, up a fourth, down a third. It is known as Monte Principale. Okay? And the cool thing about Monte Principale is that the way we can harmonize it, it all, it all takes chords of the fifth, so whatever's in the bass, you just do that chord. So D, and then G, and then E minor, and then A. I just have to not play parallel octaves or fifths in the upper voice. So I'm going, see how my upper voices are moving opposite? Uh, sorry, it's to there. To there. So, as my bass goes up a fourth, 
my upper voices go down a third. Now my bass goes down a third and my upper voices go up a fourth. Now my bass goes up a fourth and my upper voices go down a third. The bass goes down a third and the upper voices go up a fourth if I want to keep going. So I can do this. Uh, rather here. So did you notice, one's doing a fourth while one's doing a third, and then they switch, and then they switch, and they switch. So that means whatever I use to fill in one of those intervals, we can take turns doing that, because we take turns doing each interval. So let's just take the fourth, and let's go da ti ta ta And now the bass goes, well, I can fill in a fourth. And the soprano and the alto go, well, yeah, well, we can fill in a fourth. And the bass goes, well, I can fill in a fourth. And so you get automatic canon, automatic imitation when you use Monte Principale. Monte Principale is one of the favorite motions for counterpoint because it has so much built-in imitation. Not only at the, uh, at the octave, but you can, you can even do it at the, um, at the fifth if you know what you're doing. So this is a standard motion, a standard plan that easily gives rise to canon, and it actually makes it very easy to improvise canon. It's useful in fugue. And here we have it in real life in Mr. Rummo. And finally, let's look at the opening. Uh, this will be the first few bars, and we'll just take downbeats in the bass. D, to A, to B. F sharp to G to D. And the pattern here is up a fifth, which is the same as going down a fourth, okay? And then up a second. Although in real life, you won't keep going up in music because when you have large intervals, you have to jump down. So what we actually have is up a fifth, up a second, down a fourth, up a second, down a fourth, and that ends up being the same thing, okay? Each of these also takes chord of the fifth. So on the D in the bass, the harmony is D. On the A, the harmony is mostly A. On the B, the harmony is B minor, and then F sharp minor, and then G, and then D. Except that we have these suspensions that we already talked about. So notice that this first suspension right there if I just hold that and I change the rest of the chord, I get this beautiful suspended fourth above the bass. Now resolve it, hang on to that, move the bass, the step, and move everything else, and now I get this ninth above the bass. Resolve that, move the bass and everything else, hold the soprano, suspended fourth, resolve, move everything else, Suspended ninth and suspended fourth. So this alternates suspended fourths and suspended ninths, trades every measure, okay? And in the case of Rameau, we get the suspended fourth right here, and it resolves and then moves away to other stuff, and meanwhile that same note is picked up here and becomes the suspension there. It resolves, but then it goes and does other stuff. That same note is picked up here, suspend, resolve. That same note is picked up here, there, resolve. That same note is picked up here, there, resolve. Magnificent. Okay, let's hear this whole thing. Does it work in minor? That would be a yes. This has a name. Actually, two names. The main name is Romanesca. 
very, very old and uh, frequently used type of motion. Extremely familiar within the Partimento tradition. There are hundreds, maybe thousands of Partimenti exercises just built around this. When we use suspensions on every downbeat, sometimes we also call it by the name perfidia. Um, and that just means obstinacy. It's like the same thing every every time. Okay, so I, I usually, if, if it's going to have all the suspensions, I usually call it perfidia, but it's also a Romanesca because of the way the bass moves. Okay, um, and, and the beauty of, of this is that it works in major, it works in minor, and by the way, you can start, I could start here, and now my first suspension will be that. Okay? Uh, sorry, I'm getting all this stuff here. Uh, what if I put in a different position of the chord? What if I go like... Yes, I can double suspend. That will work too. All right? It's very, very powerful, very flexible. And that's why this opening sounds so great. <laughs> is because it's driven by this um, old, time-tested, trusted, foolproof, idiot-proof bass motion known as the Romanesca. So actually, this much up to here is only Romanesca. Okay, we already talked about this uh, with the bass suspensions to here. That's also very, very well known. That's just known as a tied bass. Very familiar. And then we had a cadence, and then we had a Monte Principale, which went to here, and then we had, we, we uh, changed key, did a little modulation there, and then we started our descending 7-6, and then we did our ascending 5-6, and we're done. And so it's not really... So much accurate to say that this piece includes some of these partimento ideas. It's more accurate to say it is made entirely of these ideas from partimento. And now you begin to understand the power of partimento and what you gain when you study it. So that's just a real quick view of the, um, the little Entree of Polymnia from Boyad by Rameau and how lovely and beautiful it is. Uh, some of the things you have to think about when you play transcriptions, some of the things you have to think about when you want a gorgeous, melty, gooey chocolate sound, and the insights of the Partimento tradition. I hope that's enough to keep you busy and happy today as you wait out these days of isolation. So, until next time, I hope you're well, be safe, 